I was in the uh, Everett Congregation Worldwide Church of God for about 36 years when it started in uh, 1978. And the services there were pretty similar to what we have here. They were an hour and a half, except that we started a little bit later. We started at 2.30 and ended at 4. However, toward the end of the time I was there the last several years, it seemed like the services had gotten longer and longer, and finally the minister um, sat down with the speakers, and there were four of us that were giving split sermons when he wasn't giving the sermon. And he said, okay, now here's how the service is going to be. I want the first person that's giving the first split sermon to sit down at 3.15, which would have been exactly halfway through the hour and a half. He says, sit down at 3.15, and then the second speaker and the announcements and special music and that type of thing would follow that. Um, we had one thing that was a little different in the service, however. After the opening prayer, after the first three songs, there was something that they were calling intercessory prayer, and that is where the mic would be open for people from the congregation to come up and give a public prayer and it could be for something going on in their life, if they were having a financial problem, if they were having a marital problem, if there was a health issue. Uh, they could pray for the work. They could pray for hurricanes going on in some part of the United States. Anything that they were moved to want to pray about. Well, one particular day, I was scheduled to give the first half of the split sermon. And we got started a little late for some reason. The song leader happened to lead three, you know, fairly long songs. They were four or five verses each. The man giving the opening prayer gave a rather long prayer. And it seemed like everyone wanted to get up and give an intercessory prayer that morning. So they kept coming up and coming up, and finally they fin finished. And when I got up to speak, it was exactly 3.15. And so I got up and I said, well, the first message is supposed to be done at 3.15, so I guess I can just sit down now. And of course, the minister was sitting on the front row and he shook his head. No, you're not getting away with that. So anyway, I gave a rather abbreviated uh, split sermon. It was more like a, a sermonette so that at least the second message didn't have to be so shortened if we were gonna you know, end on time. Well, that happens all the time. You know, we have late starts here. Something maybe doesn't go right with the sound system. Uh, and maybe someone who is giving, you know, doing the song leading gets here late because of a traffic problem, uh, road construction, or an accident. These things happen all the time in our lives. And so when that happens, we have to be flexible. We have to adapt to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. That's just the way life is. We need to have flexibility in our lives. You know, if our schedule is so tightly wound that we have no wiggle room when problems come up, that's what creates additional problems, problems with our family, with our spouse, with our children, at work. 
with the boss, with our friends, with other members in church, if we're on such a rigid, such a tight schedule that is so methodical that you can't vary it at all, that's when you have problems. When I was in grade school, and high school as well, um, I ro rode the school bus until I was a senior in high school. I had the use of the family car at that time. But I used to sit next to a boy in my class. He lived a couple miles down the road, and we tended to sit t next to each other over this period of time. So I, I got to know him pretty well. Um, he was a Jehovah's Witness, and he told me all about the things he believed. He told me about the trips he and his family would take during the summer to go to their conventions. And I guess they were, you know, similar to our feast, except they were a lot shorter and they tended to be on weekends. But anyway, they happened during the summer, and one time in particular, he went all the way back to New York. Now, they were driving, and the, the roads, of course, were nowhere near what they are now, so it took them four days to get there and four days to get back. So anyway, I got well acquainted with his beliefs. One day we were talking about working, and he told me something that seemed really strange and really peculiar at the time. And he said, you know, John, when I work for someone, I never work at 100%. He said, I always leave just a little bit in case my boss asks me to do something more. And then I have that reserve to do it. And, you know, at the time, that seemed really bizarre and strange to me. And, of course, you know, we tend to think um, we're supposed to do everything with all our might. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes. But, you know, I thought about that, and I thought that's not really totally bizarre. If you follow the principle of always having that little extra reserve, if something else is needed, then you have it to give. If you're right up to the top of your head and don't have anything, you don't have anything left to give. You know, if you're running a race, unless, say, it's a 100-yard dash or something fairly short, and certainly a marathon, the people running these types of races always have to gauge, they always have to allow for that little extra. They want to be able to kick in at the end in case it's very close. But you can imagine what someone running a marathon would be like if they went full out. You know, they'd never make it. Our, our lives program so we have that reserve. So when the need arises that you have, that we have the reserve capacity to go the extra foot, the extra yard, the extra mile, as the case may be, what do we need to do to or perhaps to eliminate in our lives, to make our lives more manageable and easier because we have some reserve. You know, you can use your imagination because you all know your own situation and you can come up with any number of ideas because what works for one of us may not work for the other. But we need to learn to be flexible and not reluctant to do or try something outside the box, as the case may be. Of course, paying attention to all the rel 
relevant circumstances that you know we're involved with. Turn to Ecclesiastes 11, verse 4. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 4. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. And if you think about it back at that time, it was basically a, an agrarian society. And you see pictures of people sowing something, and they usually had a, a bag tied around their neck of seeds, and they'd go out like this. This is how they'd sow. They'd, you know, throw the seed out on the ground. We're told here, though, you have to pay attention to what the weather's like. Because if the wind is blowing 35 or 40 miles an hour, you're more than likely going to be seeding your neighbor's field rather than your own. So you have to pay attention. You have to look and observe what's going on around you in your life, where that wind is, where the wind is blowing, and also continuing on, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. So if it looks like it's going to rain, you don't, you know, start thinking about cutting your hay. Because if it's, you know, down when it's rained on, then it's no longer any good. And sometimes this happens where there's a field of grass that's been cut and perhaps is not entirely cured because there wasn't enough sun. And then it's baled. And there's some green hay inside that bale that's tightly compressed and it starts to ferment and that creates heat and that heat sometimes explodes into fire. And there have been cases where a bale of hay in someone's barn caused it to burn to the ground. He that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. So you have to evaluate here again the circumstances in your life. What's going on in your life? Where should you be sowing and where should you be reaping? Or where should you not be sowing and not reaping, as the case may be? Let's look at another example. A well-known parable you're all familiar with, you probably can recite it by heart, or at least the principles. Turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, and this is the place where we're told about the parable of the talents, and I'm going to paraphrase some of the story. Um, you know, it says a man traveled to a far land, and I want you to remember the word far. It was a distant land. It wasn't just, you know, down the road a few miles. And if you think back to that time, you hear, you've read in your history books about Marco Polo taking these long trips that took years to to, to, you know, culminate, it, it, uh, that's what this was. He was traveling to a far land. It wasn't, you know, in Oregon or it wasn't in Idaho. It perhaps was in North Carolina. And because he was gone and knew he was going to be gone for a long time, he entrusted his goods to his servants. In verse 15, one got five talents, one got two, and one got one, according to his several ability. So the boss knew what these servants were capable of doing. They'd probably been in his employ for a long time. And he knew that one was maybe older and more experienced and more capable and could be entrusted with five talents, whereas the one 
that he only gave two to perhaps was younger, didn't have as much experience. And maybe he was totally unsure about the one he gave one to. Uh, maybe he was testing him to see just what he would do with the one. So anyway, in verse 16, we see what happened. The one with five talents went out and traded and made five more. And when you look at the word traded, it, it indicates he was out there busy doing something. I don't know what kind of a business he ran, if he was out buying camels and raising them or out buying some kind of spice. It doesn't tell, but in any event, he was busy doing something. He wasn't just sitting on his laurels. So he traded and made five more. And then the one, verse 17, with two, gained other two. So he was doing something probably similar to what the first one was, but he didn't have quite as much. He didn't quite have as much experience. And so he only gained two. But the interesting thing is they both doubled their money. They both doubled what they had. In verse 18, but the one that got one talent buried his Lord's money. So verse 19, after a long time. And so once again, I was emphasizing the fact that he wasn't gone overnight. It was a long time, and it was probably years, because if you look at the, the word long and look at the other um, explanations of that word, it means also can mean great. It was, you know, not just a small, it was a great, it's a large time, it was a long time. But in any event, after the time had elapsed, the boss came back and reckoneth with them. He wanted an accounting of what they'd done. So they sat down at a table and the one with five said, well, you know, during the time you were gone, my f the five you gave me has doubled, and here's ten. And so the boss praised him. He said, you know, that's, that's really great. And then the one with two explained that I made two more. The boss complimented him as well. Verse 24. Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man. You know, I knew what your reputation was, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed or where you've scattered. I like to think of the example of Warren Buffett, who earned close to $10 billion during the last financial crisis we had a few years back. $10 billion profit. And why? Because he was able to lend money to companies that were in serious trouble that might likely go bankrupt. They wouldn't be bailed out by the U.S. government. And so he had the money to lend, but that money came at a price. He got 10% interest on some of his loans. And when you're talking about billions, you can understand why I think you know, I don't know how much he loaned in total, but the $10 billion was simply the interest on what he loaned. And that's going back to the boss. He was a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown. I mean, he, Warren was lending money 
But he wasn't out producing. He wasn't out making something. He wasn't manufacturing something. But he was taking advantage of a situation. And there have to be people like that because otherwise the companies would have gone under. Gab or, uh, so he had not sown or gathering where their house not scattered. But anyway, continuing on, verse 25, and because I knew you were like that, because I knew that's the way you were, I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth, and here it is. He probably had wrapped it up, and it was all shiny and bright and polished. It was like an uncirculated coin. If they had inscriptions on it, you would have been able to have re read them perfectly on that talent. And here's what his Lord said to him, verse 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew my reputation. You knew what I was like. You know what, knew what I expected. You know, sloths are noted for slowness of movement. You know, they very ponderous when they move. They spend most of their lives hanging by their tails in trees in Central and South America. And this is what a sloth, and he, and he was calling him slothful. That's what you're like. I'm going to go to Proverbs 26, 14, but we're coming back to one more verse here. But in Proverbs 26, 14, we're told, As a door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. He's totally inflexible. If you think about a door on hinges, it swings back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that's the only movement it makes. Opens and shuts, but it still hangs where it, um, you know, it did. And so is one that's slothful. He turns back and forth on his bed, doesn't get out. The people who are going through the door are the ones, the one that made five, that had five parables, or the one that had two. They are busy. They're up early in the morning. They're going out into the marketplace, out into the fields. They're out working. They're out doing something. The slothful man is just, you know, back and forth. Doesn't even bother to turn off the alarm clock and probably doesn't need one because he's used to sleeping until noon anyway. Uh, he's been so inert. Well, this is... This is what he said to the man that, that, uh, that was slothful. He just didn't move. He's been so inert so long and so acclimated to that lifestyle. You know, it's become habitual to him. And it's almost impossible to change. Uh, hence the comparison with the door. You've heard about people, uh, professors in college or school teachers that have tenure in teaching. And once it's been achieved, it's almost impossible for a school to get rid of a teacher or professor. You know, you sometimes get them who, who have been teaching the same thing for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, like in college and are teaching exactly the same thing. They've not gained any additional knowledge um, or real experience. They have no different judgment. Their teacher has a soporific effect 
on the students. That is to say, it puts them to sleep. That's what soporific is. It's sleep-inducing. And I think we've all had teachers like that, be it high school or college. They may know their subject, but they don't have any interest in it anymore. They've been doing it so long, and why should they bother to get excited or to be creative in any way because they're guaranteed their salary? Anyway, going back to Matthew 25 and verse 27, Matthew 25, verse 27, the boss told the slothful servant, you should have taken the money to the three camels saving and loans bank down on East Jericho Street, and at least I would have had interest. If you'd put it out for usury, at least I would have had something. You would have made something. Back then, a talent averaged about 65 pounds. In reading in the commentaries and you know, other uh, places, it was listed at as much as 130 pounds, but usually for the most part, somewhere between 60 and 70 pounds. So I just took the average of 65. If you multiply the 65 pounds times 16 ounces per pound, that would have been 1040 ounces. And a recent gold price was $1,267 per ounce. So 1,267 times 1,040, you would have had a figure of 1,318,000. And I just rounded these figures off for sake of illustration. So five talents of gold would have been worth 6590 and he made that much as well. So the boss would have received back 18 or 13,180. And the one with two talents, his gold would have been worth 2,636,000. ,000, and he would have given his boss back 5,272,000. ,000. And you know about the one with one talent. His is worth the 1,318,000, and that's what the boss received back. It was bright and shiny, it wasn't marred. You could read the date like a brand new copper penny that's uncirculated. And then, by contrast, you'll have occasionally run into one that's blackened and so marred and thin you can no longer read the date on it. But his was bright and shiny, but still the same, still worth the same. Actually, minus the interest that it didn't earn, minus the opportunity cost of not having been out there and been working. If you take an interest rate of 1% times that amount, and say for five years, say the boss is gone for five years, and I just, you know, pulled that figure out to use for illustration, and compound that interest yearly, his money, if he had at least put it in the bank, would have been worth six, I mean, would have earned $67,231. You know, no small amount. Or if it had been in the bank at 5% interest for five years, compounded yearly, it would have been worth $364,139. Now, the reality is none of these figures really impact us because we can't identify with those amounts. So let's take silver, for example, a silver talent, which recently, Silver, um, let's see, what was it? Oh, yes. 
recently silver was $15.93 an ounce. And you multiply that times the 1040 ounces of a talent, it would have meant that the talent was only worth $16,567 compared to what the gold would have been. 1% interest on this compounded yearly for five years would have only been $845. 5% for five years, $4,577. The point is, I think we can more readily identify with these figures, but at least he would have earned his boss something, but he didn't. And when you get right down to it, the use of gold, silver, five years, one year, 1%, 5%, you can use any kind of combination of figures to get just about any kind of result. But the point is, regardless of what you use, he still could have earned his boss something. But he was inflexible. He was afraid. He buried it. You know, I can see him presenting it. He's unwrapping the silk or cloth or whatever. You know, it's all a little dirty, and here's this really bright, shiny piece of metal five years later, the same as what the boss had given him. And the important point about this whole thing, this whole example, is what are we doing with the talents in our lives? What are we doing with what God has given us? You know, how and what are we going to have to show our boss when he comes back? You know, will our gold, our silver, our bronze, our copper, our steel, or whatever we have been given in the way of talents still be bright and shiny, but remain the same as when we received it or when we were called? Or will it look tarnished and worn, and will it be worth two or five times more than what it was originally, even in spite of the fact that it may have nicks and scratches through the, because of the vagaries of just living? You know, there's obviously a great deal of symbolism in this example, but I think it's pretty clear that God is greatly merciful. He's greatly compassionate to us all, toward all of us, and understands those nights when we come home all stressed out because of what's happened at work, and the additional stress of navigating I-5, 405, 522, 167, or whatever your highway of choice is, he knows all that. He understands the stresses we have in our life. He understands the stresses of living. You know, he gives us a certain number of days to accomplish what we're destined to, to do in our lives. We're all destined to do something. You know, that's our reason for being here. But we don't know how much time we may have left to do them. You know, our, number, our days are numbered, just like the few passengers that were riding that train earlier between Tacoma and Portland, or Seattle and Portland. You know, the one that derailed on its inaugural, inaugural trip this past Monday. You know, some of the survivors of that accident, I'm not talking about the several that died, but some of the survivors are going to have injury, injuries that are significantly going to impact them for the rest of their lives. 
you know, they didn't have any inkling of what was ahead when they heard the conductor, you know, call all aboard that morning. It was only a few scant hours later as they were being pulled from the twisted wreckage of that train and listening to the moans and the cries of the people that were injured and maybe themselves doing the same thing. They probably weren't thinking very lucidly uh, or enough to think about what was going to happen for the rest of their lives because they were battling the horror and the shock of what had just happened. You know, maybe they'd had no feeling, maybe they had no thoughts at all until later on. Well, our master has gone away to a far country for an indeterminate time. We don't know how long that's going to be. We speculate, we estimate, we guesstimate and, and think we have a fair idea, but the reality is we don't know the exact time. And we were told, you know, in a time you think not, he will come. So we can't rest on our laurels. We don't know exactly when he'll return, but we know that he will. And at that time, he'll want to sit down with us. I like to think of him as a father and a friend who says, hey, let's go down to the corner of Star Starbucks and have a, you know, a cup of coffee together. And you're sitting down across the table. And he says, you know, what have, what have you done with the talents that I've given you over the, you know, the extent of your lifetime? I don't think, you know, it's exactly going to be that way, but I like to think of God as a father in that way with a son or a daughter, that we have the kind of compassion that he will give us. You know, this loving side of Jesus, I think we all hope he will have that kind of compassion toward us. I hope we all have that. You know, we need to be more flexible and use the talents we've been given. We're not expected to do something that we aren't talented enough to do. And I think that's important to understand. You're not expected to do something that you don't have the innate ability to do. Everyone is given different genetic a different genetic makeup based on your parents. And those are things you don't have a lot of control over, but within the framework of what you have, what are you doing with what you have? We really should structure our lives with reserves so we don't burn out, but yet can accomplish what we were given to do so let's look at our own lives. Let's look at the reserves we have or don't have, as the case may be. Let's resolve to do our very best so that when, with God's help, we won't feel like the example of the man swinging back and forth on a door, back and forth, not going anywhere, not doing anything. The only movement in his life is from one side of the bed to the other. Instead, let's use our own individual talents, working and trading and gaining something for our Lord and Master. If we all do this when he returns and we give our accounting, 
It will be great to hear him say to the entire Bellevue congregation, well done, thou good and faithful servants.